Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lara Schilling, and I am the content specialist for teacher programs here at LACMA. Um, a little self description I am a white woman with curly blonde hair and bangs. I'm wearing a gold chain necklace and a gray t shirt, and I'm sitting here in my living room. Um, there's a chair behind me and some white closet doors. I'm really pleased to welcome you to Evenings for Educators, which is LACMA's oldest teacher professional development program. If you would like to access live captions at this program, please click live transcript and then show subtitle at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions today, please feel free to send us a message through the Q&A, which you'll also be using to submit questions for our speaker. And I would now like to share a land acknowledgement from my current residence on ancestral Tongva land in South Los Angeles. So if we could go to the next slide. LACMA respectfully acknowledges that the lands on which our museum is built and the region that we serve is the ancestral and unceded territories of the Gabrielino Tongva, Gabrielino Quich, Fernandino Tataviam, and Venturino Chumash peoples. Los Angeles County has been and is home to many indigenous peoples. As an art museum and a collecting institution, LACMA recognizes the role we play in the continual displacement of indigenous peoples, and we are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing effects of this legacy, building networks of support for local indigenous groups and being better stewards of the land we occupy. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, we've been having a lot of conversations in the education department about you recently and how much we honor and value the work you're doing. Um, and we created a small expression of our appreciation, or maybe we could call it a Valentine, um, a little early Valentine that um, we're gonna share in the chat now. On behalf of everyone in the department, I just wanna say thank you for all you do for LA County Youth. Starting today and ending next Thursday, um, we'll go to the next slide, please. We're highlighting the special exhibition, What Would You Say? Activist Graphics from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art which looks at the work of designers and artists in California who have used their creativity to advocate for civil rights, oppose wars and injustice, and press for change. The exhibition is on view at four partner venues across the county, Lancaster, Riverside, Northridge, and East LA through the spring of next year. So there are a lot of opportunities for you to see it. Um, the calendar's up on the slide right now, and you can also find it on our website. And now I'll talk a little bit about the program. Next slide, please. Today we have a lecture with curator Stacey Steinberger where she'll, where she'll provide an overview of the exhibition. Thursday is our first hands-on workshop where you'll have a chance to use yarn to create text-based activist messages. And next Tuesday is a talk with artists Irena Cervantes and Jessica Sabogal, which I'll say more about in just a minute. And next Thursday, we'll close the program with a hands-on workshop that will introduce you to the basics of designing your own posters. And registration info for all of these events can be found by clicking the link in the chat. Um, next slide, please. So I wanna take just an extra minute to plug next Tuesday's talk with Irena Cervantes and Jessica Sabogal because it is going to be really special. Cervantes and Sabogal are Latinx artists from different generations in different parts of California that have rich histories of activist art, LA and the Bay Area respectively. Both artists center women of color in their work and both create art in a wide range of media from prints and posters on paper to large murals. The program will be recorded um, and uploaded to YouTube afterwards, but we'd love to see you there live. Next slide. And the last event that I'm gonna plug before we get started is the Educator Speaker Series, which comes back next month with a program on arts integration and elementary education, featuring four teachers from our partner school, the Charles White Visual Arts Magnet. The image on this slide shows an activity that first grade teacher Miss Martinez does with her students where they analyze works of art in LACMA's collection, discuss consonant blends, and create corresponding flashcards. So the example you see here is an artwork with a frog in it, and the consonant blend that students have to figure out is FR. Finally, Eves for Ed is an LAUSD salary point course. If you are attending for salary point or professional development credit, you must fill out the surveys that are shared in the chat at the end of each event you attend. So we will be sharing a survey later this evening um, and just make sure you, you check that out. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And I will now introduce our speaker, Stacy Steinberger. Stacy Steinberger is an associate curator of decorative arts and design at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. 
A specialist in modern design and craft, Seinberger also serves as the project lead for LACMA's interdepartmental initiative to collect and exhibit graphic design, which is very exciting and very important. She has curated or co-curated several exhibitions and installations at the museum, including Found in Translation, Design in California and Mexico, 1915 to 1985 with Wendy Kaplan, Mineo Mizuno, Harmony, West of Modernism, California Graphic Design, 1975 to 1995, and Ed Fella, Free Work in Due Time. She also played a key role in organizing the exhibitions California Design 1930 to 1965, Living in a Modern Way, and The Presence of the Past, Peter Zumthor Reconsiders LACMA. Welcome, Stacy. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Lara. Um, and as she said, my name is Stacy Steinberger, and um, I'm an associate curator of decorative arts and design here at LACMA and um, some self description. I am a white woman in my mid thirties um, with long reddish hair, which is pulled back because I could use a haircut. Um, I have blue glasses and a black top and I'm sitting in an actual office um, with boring white walls because my two year old son would be giving with this talk, this talk with me if I was at home. Um, so thank you for joining me here. Um, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak with you all tonight about the exhibition, What Would You Say? Activist Graphics for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, um, which is currently on view at the Lancaster Museum of Art and History as part of our local access, access partnership, um, which was made possible by a grant from the Art Bridges Terra Foundation Initiative. Um, one bit of housekeeping, um, and I know Laura mentioned this as well, but I'm looking forward to taking your questions at the end, um, so please put them in the Q&A feature on Zoom. Next slide. This exhibition explores the intersection of inventive design and political activism in California specifically um, from the late 1960s through the present. It's not a comprehensive look at that subject. Um, it would need to be a much larger project to address all of the important issues and movements that have taken root in the state. Instead, um, the show uses LACMA's collection to look at a few different moments um, and to see how designers and artists use their talents and professional skills, um, as Lara said earlier, to champion civil rights, oppose war and injustice, and press for change. The project evolved through conversations with our partners. Um, two of them are situated in educational institutions, and all of them are deeply tied to local communities. And so we wanted to know not just how they distill, the artists distill complex issues into arresting images, but also what means and methods these artists are using to produce and distribute the images out in the world. The title for the exhibition comes from this powerful poster, which was designed by a feminist collective to provoke, promote a women's printing workshop. Um, more, that, or I guess I would say uh, a feminist organization rather than a collective, um, more than just promising to teach technical skills, the text challenges the viewer to learn what they're, to use what they're learning at the, um, at the workshop to convey their individual perspective. Um, and in doing so, it rejects patriarchal norms, which silence women's voices. The bold stripe of ink on the poster suggests that the women too have a mark to make on the world. And by choosing it as our exhibition title, um, we hoped to provoke viewers in the same way, to think critically about how artists and designers were using images, sure, but also to suggest that the viewer too may have something to say. Next slide. The exhibition starts with the work of San Francisco designer Emery Douglas, who served as the revolutionary artist and then the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party. The organization formed in Oakland in 1966 to defend against ongoing police brutality in Black communities and evolved to administer crucial social programs in impoverished Black neighborhoods. Douglas created some of his most powerful work through the organization's newspaper, using the covers and centerfold to produce posters that were guaranteed to reach huge numbers of people through a widely circulated publication. Um, and that's a strategy that you still see today. Um, his boldly drawn images reflected a community working together in struggle, from exuberant children to empowered and yes, sometimes violent revolutionaries, to emph emphatic depictions of oppressive poverty. While his figures were largely imagined, in his own telling, the images were inspired by his outreach among people and provided an opportunity to document lives that were less out of the supposed papers of records, which were in reality papers generally made by and for white audiences. Um, and I should note that this particular work is not in What Would You Say, um, but it is in LACMA's collection and you can see it now at, in the Black American Portrait Show, which is on view at LACMA. Next slide. One of the things that makes Douglas's work so remarkable is his masterful command of low cost methods of production. And 
a sort of a going theme through the show is that activists are often not working with huge budgets um, and they're really creative about the way they use their materials. So here he's using press on type, pre-printed patterns and two color printing. Um, and you'll notice that each of the newspapers has actually one only one color in addition to black. And when you see, um, and in the context of the paper, you'll see that he has the same color used without. So you can see here the front and back. So using these economical techniques, he developed a distinctive bold graphic style that perfectly communicated the organization's defiant politics. Uh, next slide. His imagery resonated with other movements for liberation and helped cement the party's alliance with the global network of decolonial movements, um, which in turn embraced his work. In 1968, um, a Cuban artist enlarged one of Douglas's illustrations for a 1968 poster um, that was distributed by the Havana-based organization of Solidarity for the Peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, known as Oshpal. Next slide. This type of solidarity happened within um, California as well. In 1969, the, the Black Panther newspaper turned over a portion of several issues um, of the paper to Basta Ya, which was organized by the Committee to Defend Los Sieta de la Raza. Los Sieta were seven Latino youths who were accused of killing a police officer during an altercation in the San Francisco Mission District. And their causes, as well as the bio biased media cover that followed, really galvanized um, Latino activists and played a huge role um, in the civil rights movement. And I, sh I should say that the young men were ultimately acquitted. So among the organization's founders was an influential Chicana artist, Yolanda Lopez. She um, and her paper his editor, Donna James Amador, met with Douglas, um, and he provided them with insights on how to produce inexpensive but effective newspaper layouts, you know, cutting columns from existing papers and, and things like that um, in order to make the best use of their techniques. Next slide. Lopez's images came to visually define the cause, um, particularly this haunting poster, which appeared on the paper's cover. Lopez transformed the stripes of the American flag into bars of a jail cell, contrasting patriotic ideals of freedom with the realities of racism. Only six views are pictured in the image, you'll notice, and the seven was actually never apprehended. A later cover of the paper shows that the poster was carried in marches and rallies um, and embraced by activists. Next slide. This is um, a copy of the poster in Lachmuth Collection, which came directly from the artist um, who passed away last year. And on the back, um, you'll see that there's a handwritten sign advertising sales of both Bastia and um, the Black Panther paper, um, as well as other literature. And I love the fact um, that that that's the copy that we have. I think it's really a wonderful reminder um, that while we now recognize the images that are in the show as important works of art, they were originally created as tools in movement in movement building and not precious artifacts. And you can see that there are, you know, sort of details of use in a lot of these works, you know, holes that show that they were pinned up on walls and carried in marches. And um, I just love that they have they had a life like that. Next slide. Um, these themes of movement building, collectivity, and solidarity are important throughout the show, and they come together in this work by Chicano artist Rupert Garcia. Garcia was a Vietnam veteran who became deeply, deeply engaged in anti-war efforts through what was then called the Third World Liberation Front, a movement that developed solidarity among oppressed peoples around the world. This po poster is an example of that kind of effort. It depicts the iconic Black activist and academic Angela Davis, who was arrested on forced murder charges in 1970 and later acquitted. Um, her face really became ubiquitous. It was on buttons, it was on, on posters internationally. Um, and Garcia's, I think, is one of a really um, iconic and amazing depiction. Um, he had originally studied painting um, and had a really deep interest in pop art, but he decided to switch his focus to screen printing during this period because he knew that creating less expensive works in multiples would allow him to reach a broader audience. He and other artists led workshops to teach activists screen printing so that they um, could create posters for civil rights and anti-war movements. And um, I think that that's another theme throughout the show is really um, you know teaching throughout generations. And I, I love that. Um, that this is a, a talk for educators because this really is a show that has a lot of education in it. Next slide. So all the artists I mentioned so far, Douglas, Lopez, and Garcia began creating influential activist art when they were students. Um, and I don't need to tell this group, but students have long played an essential role in building movements for change. These two anonymous posters were created at a student-led workshop at the University of California, Berkeley in 1970. 
That year, college student activists across the country were galvanized by the escalation of the Vietnam War and the murder of four protesters at Kent State University. Many formed screen printing workshops in response um, to get their message out to the streets. At Berkeley, there were already workshops happening at the off-campus campus Chicano Art Center led by artist Malakias Montoya, um, which also began producing anti-Vietnam War posters among works on other subjects. The posters that are on view here um, and in the show were created at a new workshop that sprung up with um, art and design students at the College of Environmental Design at Berkeley. The students were using found materials. Um, one thing that you'll notice in the poster on the right here is the telltale perforations um, from you know, old computer office or computer feed office paper. Um, and on the back, there's just you know, some sort of you know, benign off office printing. This was clearly some sort of scrap paper. Um, and they printed thousands of posters and hundreds of different designs using the resources they had at hand. You can see here um, the range of the images that they produced, many of which incorporated pop culture references. Um, on the right, you see a parody of the iconic Coca-Cola advertising campaign, which connected the global export of American consumer products and the destructive force of American weapons abroad. Um, and the one on the left uses a psychedelic aesthetic popularized by San Francisco concert posters from a few years before. Next slide. Los Angeles artist Karita Kent also used popular culture references and vibrant psychedelic colors in her work. These prints transform familiar song lyrics by the Beatles in one case, um, Yellow Submarine, and Pete Seeger's folk anthem, Where Have All the Flowers Gone, into wake up calls to the public to confront the death and destruction of the Vietnam War, taking the familiar um, and causing us to reconsider. Karita, as you may know, was herself an influential educator who embraced and taught screen printing as a democratic medium for communication. A sister of the Order of the Immaculate Heart of Mary until 1968, she confronted political issues like, the war, like war and racist oppression with moral urgency. While the artist admitted discomfort with marches and rallies, she saw a role for artwork in building of a movement. As she described it, quote, Using words with visual forms and just short passages is often a way to help awaken people to something that they may not be aware of, rather than enclosing it in a book or making a speech about it. Next slide. Um, while screen printing was a popular method for activists and educators, as the last few images show, it certainly wasn't the only effective method of mass communication. This piece was created in Diazzo, a contact print pr printing process that was used in architecture and engineering. Think blueprints. Um, the designer of this work is Sheila de Bretville, who co-founded the Women's Building with artist Judy Chicago and art historian Arlene Raven. Best known as a feminist cultural center and for its influential feminist studio workshop, the organization also included a graphic center, which taught women to use professional printing equipment and helped many pursue careers in design. And the first poster I showed that the title's taken from um, advertised one of their workshops. The center emphasized collaboration and strove for non-hierarchical utopian communalism in keeping with the feminist practices like consciousness raising. De Repville encouraged the use of Diazzo, which was only a few cents per yard, to allow more women to publish and publicize their work. This poster nods to the use of an eye bolt, which resembled the female symbol, um, and women adopted it as a clever and again inexpensive symbol of their beliefs, wearing it on necklaces. Um, I'll add that in a recent interview um, that we did with De Repville, she sort of was reflecting back on this icon um, and how it, like many aspects of the 1970s feminist movement, could be seen um, as non-inclusive for trans and other non-binary people, and suggested that in some ways it's out, you know, it was powerful at the time, but may have outlived its usefulness, recognizing that the process of education and self-education um, in activism is really a lifelong pursuit. Next slide. This work, um, created by Helen Lee, a student in DeBretville's class, embraces the use of Diazzo as well as the desire to question symbols. DeBretville challenged her students to transform, quote, private conversations into public announcements, creating posters that would help them to assert their voices in spaces where they might not otherwise feel comfortable doing so. Lee, who was born in Vietnam to Chinese parents, sought to create a new symbol for women that incorporated her own uh, Chinese heritage and multicultural cultural life experience, and also asserted the right of women to have an identity not defined in relation to men. She posted her logo around Chinatown as an exercise in public consciousness raising. And you can see that in the image on the right. Next slide. Organizations such as the Women's Graphic Center went beyond teaching techniques, creating space for idealistic creative communities to thrive. Another powerful example of this is self-help graphics and art in Boyle Heights, which has long provided opportunities for Chicano and Chicano artists. 
um, and more broadly, broadly Latinx artists. In this exhibition, I focus on one workshop, the very first Maestro's Atelier, which was curated by artist Irena Cervantes in 1999. She had a two decade history with self-help before this and had been one of several artists that had advocated, had long advocated for an all female atelier um, or a focused workshop where each artist would produce a new screen print. She invited 10 other artists, all women of color, and deliberately chose an intergenerational multicultural cohort. Seizing the opportunity to foster an inclusive dialogue, she set up monthly discussions that framed the workshop as a collective endeavor in feminist expression. The artists explored identity and spirituality, as well as shared um, technical printmaking advice, and they ultimately each produced an artwork that centered around the three themes. The first theme, which is represented here in her own work um, for, the, for the workshop, was Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, a nun and intellectual in 17th century vice regal Mexico, who had become an icon of Chicana feminism. Cervantes's print celebrates what she called the, quote, subversive feminine spirit, um, she placed Sorwana in a lineage of powerful Mexican women, including the Nuatl mother goddess Tenantzin, um, an influential feminist writer, Rosario Castellanos, and a representative of the radical Zapatista movement, showing you know, sort of this, this powerful lineage. Um, and of course, um, as Lara mentioned, Irina will be joining us in conversation next Tuesday. Next slide. Other artists focused on the theme of heroines. Barbara Carrasco, who had begun volunteering with the United Farm Workers Movement, Rights Movement when she was still a student at UCLA, portrayed Dolores Huerta, who had co-founded the UFW with Cesar Chavez. The vivid, Im, sorry, the vivid colors in this image, as well as the no last name needed text, honor Huerta as an icon, while the portrait emphasizes her strength and her empathy. Next slide. Here are two works um, by some of the younger generation of artists that participated in the workshop. Lara Alvarez also addressed the theme of heroines. Her work featured the double agent Servienta, um, a spy posing as a maid on both sides of the border with Mexico. She created the character in 1995 and has continued to include her in her work since then, um, transforming the cultural invisibility of immigrant workers into a subversive superpower. The second work shown here is by Faviana Rodriguez, who studied with Irena at Berkeley and was the youngest participant in the project. Her piece addressed the workshop's third theme, the erotic, um, in a print that it critically examined the cultural scrutiny of women's sexuality. Still a student when she, when she uh, participated, she had much to learn from the more experienced artists, but also much to teach. Um, she actually introduced many in the workshop to new digital imaging techniques. And you can see an example of that in the text here, the way that it curves around in a way that would have been you know, much more difficult to produce before um, digital manipulation existed. Um, Faviana, who's based in Oakland, has actually uh, since become a powerful leader in activist art in her own right. Next slide. Digital tools uh, transformed activism and political image making in many ways, making it easier for artists to both produce and distribute their messages without the need for professional printing experience, um, which had created barriers in earlier generations. By the early 2000s, Artists were creating works with the explicit intention of circulating them on the growing World Wide Web. Some of them took the form of copyright-free downloadable posters, which activists could, e could easily print or to post or carry in marches. This form took off in the early years of the controversial Iraq War, when anti-war websites in multiple countries aggregated copyright-free protest graphics. So one noticeable example out of California was another poster for peace organized by a young San Francisco graphic designer, Kimberly Cross. She felt that most of the political graphics were aimed at people who already supported the cause. And she felt that designers who had professional training at recent, reaching mass audiences might be able to produce works that had broader appeal. As she explained on the website, quote, our goal is to help create a grassroots anti-campaign to counter the brilliant marketing of, sorry, my lights went out because I haven't moved. <laughs> sorry, I'll start the quote again. Um, our goal is to help create a grassroots anti-campaign to counter the brilliant marketing the US administration is currently running to promote its war agenda. She shared her own poster, Don't Buy It, which depicted a bomb tucked inside the Amer an American flag shopping bag. This was actually a parody of a prominent post 9-11 campaign, America Open for Business. She then solicited works from professional designers across the country, including this one by another Californian, Glenn Sakamoto. Next slide. Designers have continued to work 
in both digital and print formats, seeing advantages to both. The Bay Area Collective, Dignidad Rebelde, made up of artists Melanie Cervantes and Jesus Barraza, circulate most of their images freely online and have seen them used in protests around the world, um, as well as reaching thousands of people through social media. At the same time, they continue to see value in producing screen printed works. Both artists learned screen printing from earlier politically engaged artists of color, Jesus from the Latino printmaker Juan Fuentes and Melanie from David Bradford, who is associated with the Black Arts Movement. Their printed works create a more permanent record of the lives of people of color who have often left out of history books. As Melanie has said, quote, political graphics play a role in public memory. They can also be acts of community building in their own right. Dignidad collaborated with Mexican political artist Bezatl on this intimate portrait of Trayvon Martin, a Florida teenager killed by a neighborhood watchman in 2012. The poster was printed in a participatory public session that the artist described as the communal processing of an immense amount of grief and rage. They, can, they also shared the image widely online, making it freely accessible for protests in what became the Black Lives Matter movement. Next slide. You'll notice that portraits like Martin's play a central role in activist graphics, reminding us that the work of activism is done by and for people. Yet the choice of which face to represent a movement is itself a political one. The Amplifier's Foundation, the Amplifier Foundation's We the People series use powerful images of women to assert an inclusive vision of America at a time when the nation's changing demographics were at the center of a cultural rift. Created in response to the election of Donald Trump, the portraits portray women from Muslim, Latina, Black, Indigenous, and LGBT communities who felt attacked by the president-elect's racist and misogynist rhetoric. Here are two works from the series. The influential political street artist, Shepard Ferry, who is white, collaborated with photographers who provided, sorry, who shared the identities of their subjects. And this is one um, of a series of posters. In this case, he worked with DC photographer, Ridwan Adhami, to, who provided the basis for Ferry's idealized heroic image of a Muslim woman. On the right, you have a work by Ernesto Urena, who identifies as Chicano indigenous, and he depicted Lakota elder Helen Redfeather, a longtime activist in the American Indian movement. Summing up his practice, in a, he said, quote, I want to make artwork that's for something. I'm for dignity, I'm for resilience, I'm for Mother Earth, I'm for honoring elders, I'm for working with my friends, and I'm for making positive messages. And I think that really comes through in this work. Uh, next slide. Um, and Jurena often depicts real individuals in his images, putting a concrete face on a movement. At the same time, um, he uses a pared down graphic style that helps these faces to seem more universal and iconic. And bold lighting and radiating, radiating lines that su suggest the heroism in their work. Um, so I'm guessing many of you are familiar with this poster, which he created for the uh, 2019 UTLA strike which features a real teacher, Roxana Joinus, who teaches math, science, and technology, sorry, teaches at the Math, Science, and Technology Magnet Academy at Roosevelt High School. Next slide. Individual portraits can also serve as a form of reclamation and education. Um, transgender non-binary artist, Micah Bazant, created this poster to honor the legacy of Marsha P. Johnson, a mother of the trans and queer liberation movement. And one of the trans women of color who initiated the 1969 rebellion turned protest, now known as the Stonewall Uprising. Bazan's work is part of a larger trans led movement to tell a more complete story of LGBTQ activism, which moves away from narratives that have long centered white cis male leaders. They created this poster after learning about Johnson um, from trans filmmaker Tourmaline, who helped initiate a new interest in her work um, through an online archive and film. And this work um, was created for Pride, which grew out of the Stonewall Uprising and uses the slogan, um, Pride for some of, no pride for, for some of us without liberation for all of us, which ties back to the um, radical origins of Stonewall, you know, in the face of what many have come to see as, as you know, sort of a more corporate and whitewashed event. So next slide. But not every portrait um, fe features well-known figures. The work of Oakland artist, Jessica Sabagal, broadly celebrates women of color, Latinx and indigenous culture and queer identity. This image shows a Bay Area immigrant street vendor, um, an acquaintance of the artist, in an image that was inspired by heroic World War II propaganda posters, pushing back against rhetoric that, you know, anti-immigrant rhetoric that questioned the people's rights to be here. Sabagal raises up the hardworking vendor as herself a patriotic symbol of American achievement and identity, incorporating her indigenous garments into the national flag. Next slide. 
Um, oh, and before I should have mentioned before that, but Jessica, of course, will also be joining us next week. So I hope that some of you will as well. Um, and I started working on this exhibition back in 2018. And even in that time, the subject of activist graphics, like so much of our lives, um, sorry, and so, since that time, it feels different and, and more urgent. Um, the, year, the last few works in the show come from the year 2020, which gave rise to momentous political energy as the American public responded to the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the racial reckoning sparked by the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other American Black people, and of course, the election. Because of the pandemic, though, it made it harder to produce printed graphics, even for in-person protests, um, and much of the active imagery, like so much of our lives, moved online. The city of LA even took a cue from decades of activist websites and solicited contributions for copyright-free downloadable posters through the LA Mask Print Project. Um, these were intended for business to businesses and organizations to print for themselves in order to encourage compliance with mask masking orders and recommendations. So this particular entry comes from designer Florencio Zavala, who had already been using his design studio and social media presence, presence to promote public health messages, as well as calls for social justice and racial equity. A father of young children, he used playful imagery to remind viewers to cover their noses. Next slide. And while the internet allowed anyone um, moved by these issues to contribute their own images to the public discourse, many widely shared graphics come from professional artists of color, such as Monica Ahanonu. Her portrait of the now instantly recognizable face of George Floyd, shown here, was one of many images of him that circulated online, reminding the world of the individual behind the horrifying news story. Ahanonu is best known for her illustrations for major brands like Adidas, Netflix, and Target, and countless publications, but has also used her expertise in visual communication and her broad platform to address urgent social justice issues and honor Black lives. Using the same vibrant palette she is known for in her commercial work, she ensured that her image would draw fragmented public attention to Floyd's murder and to his life. And I'll just conclude by saying that the images in the show um, do many kinds of work. They direct attention to injustice, they remind us of what's at stake, and they help us to distill complex issues into images that we can't forget, hopefully stirring us into action. Um, but more important, um, but I'm sorry, as important as that is, um, they also do more work than even that. Many of the artists I've discussed today are engaged in teaching others in building movements and community and imagining better worlds. And I hope that visitors to the exhibition will come away inspired to consider how their own voices and talents could do the same. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna take a look at the Q and A, but it looks like there aren't questions. Um, Thank you so much, Stacy. Yeah, I also checked the Q&A. We don't have any questions yet, but I want to invite everybody in the audience to submit some inquiries for Stacy. Um, we're excited to hear what you have to say and, you know, thinking about how you can connect this work with your students. I know there are a lot of amazing touch points here. So please submit your questions through the Q&A. Um, we would love to receive them. We'll just give a couple minutes for folks to do that. I'm also seeing some really great messages in the chat, Stacey. I don't know if you're seeing those as well. Yes, and thank you. Um, thank you for your support, everybody. It was a really, um, it, I've been, it's really been an inspiring project to work with, getting to meet all these artists and to learn from them. And um, it's a really um, amazing group of artists and one that, you know, they're all really supportive of each other. Um, so I've, I've learned a lot and, and been introduced to new artists work through the show, which has been great. Um, I, I see here, Laura, a question that may be more for you of whether, of whether or not we can make the slides available. Um, yeah, is that, would you be open to sharing the presentation, Stacey? We yeah, of course. Can... Okay, we great. Yeah. Be on, the, it'll be online, so that's, um, the okay. show itself is not virtual, um, but um, I know that um, a lot of the works are represented online through the, um, through the um, story maps on, on LACMA's website, and and um, and that way, but um, the exhibition will be at, at four venues in Southern California. Yeah, so about um, the way that you will all be able to access the slides, um, we send out uh, program, post-program emails, usually within a month or so following the event, um, and we'll have the link to Stacy's slideshow in there so that you can access it. And like she said, a lot of the images are also available through our story maps.
And I will share our resource link again um, because the story maps are linked from there. So many familiar names in the chat. Thank you all so much for coming. And it looks um, like I see. I see now. There's a couple of questions. So um, I'll take a look. The first one here is: How do you steer clear of cultural appropriation when using iconic images of a marginalized group of people? And I think that that's a really important issue, and and one uh, I don't think I have a, a clear answer on. Um, you know, I think for the most part, trying to use images um, generated from those groups, you know, where the subjects are part of the conversation, um, I think is is you know is really important. Um, I think with you know, those conversations, like so many of them around activism are evolving, evolving ones. And so I think we're always learning. Um, and I know, um, you know, it's something we have to, to really think about, especially when often the subjects themselves um, are no longer, you know, alive to speak. So, you know, I think it's just being sensitive to families and, and things like that. And it's something that um, we definitely took in, into consideration and have tried to be, um, to be thoughtful about that. But, but I think it's an important issue and one that you're right to raise here. Um, and then let's see here. In terms of the community-based project, um, I don't have so much information. I know that they do, um, the artists um, are up in the Bay Area and they do, I think that they do workshops where people are invited to come and, and to print with them. Um, I don't know for sure um, how, because I don't know for sure how they publicized that event or how many people exactly showed up, but um, I know that's something that they do in general as part of their process. Um, and they often, they teach at schools, they do other um, other ways of, of engaging the public in, in printing works um, and, and in teaching others to make images as well. Stacey, I'm also seeing a couple questions coming through the regular chat. Um, one of them is if you have any recommended reading to go along with some of the art you shared. Um, gosh, I mean, there's, I feel like there's so many different sources on each artist. Um, in terms of overall titles, um, you know, I didn't find, I mean, there's, there's a nice biography of Emory Douglas that um, shares a lot of images, his images. Um, there's a book, um, that came out a couple of years ago on Yolanda Lopez um, by Karen Mary uh, Davalos. Um, that's you know, more of an academic book, but but um, but really interesting about her work. I'm trying to think um, about more general sources. Um, it's something I think it's probably something I'd have to think about. Um, just because it, there wasn't really one book um, that I went to. It was really um, researching each each work individually. Um, and a lot of doing a lot of interviews and talking to the artists. Stacy, you'll have to write the book that provides the overview. We we have a brochure for this, but, um, <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if that's something that could be shared um, online. I have to check with. Um, Um, another question I saw was a kind of a more technical question about screen printing or mm -hmm. some of the other types of printing presented of like, if you think it would be feasible to teach, I'm guessing in the classroom is probably the question. Um, yeah, I mean, there's different, I mean, there's, you know, sort of, I've definitely done screen printing, um, you know, in, in a classroom setting. Um, I don't, I don't know what age group you're talking about, um, but there's sort of different ways that people do it. I mean, you don't, you, you know, other than the silk screen itself, there are ways that people um, use like contact paper and things like that that don't require like photosensitive equipment that um, is using professional screen printing. But I, I do know, um, like I've done it at like community art center types of settings for sure. Um, but I think I guess it would depend. Yeah, I think it, it looks like if you're talking about 12th grade, I, I mean, I remember doing it as a freshman in college, which is pretty similar. Um, so I think that that is something, and I know there's resources out there um, for ways to make that more accessible. Um, and it's fun. I mean, you can, um, 
it is, it, I think the reason a lot of these artists are drawn to it is because it is something that's fairly easy to learn how to do. Um, and I, I can remember even like, you know, in my own activism, going to workshops where we were putting armbands and t-shirts and things like that. So it's not, it's not just something that works on paper, um, which is nice. I think people get, can get really excited about stuff like that. Um, I don't know if LACMA has any resources on that. Laura could speak to that more than I could. No, the first thing that comes to mind, yeah, stencils are a great suggestion, Dana. Um, I'm also thinking of some of our teaching artists when they're working with, you know, younger folks doing screen printing, they'll start or doing printing in general, they'll start with styrofoam sheets mm -hmm. that you can scratch into, they call them like scratch foam. Um, I know we might also have some teaching artists in the audience today. If you're out there, please chime in in the chat um, with other techniques that you that you've used successfully. Yeah, and I know some of the artists also use stencils. I mean, I think that that's, you know, a lot of these things are made in, in ways that are really affordable and easy to replicate, even though these are professional artists. So, um, you know, their, their stencils are more sophisticated than what I could do, but um, I know that that's, that's something that, um, that, you know, get a lot of these works are about how do you get the message out, so. Yeah, I'm seeing some great, comments about scratch foam coming in through the chat now. And I think there's also another question in the Q&A now, Stacey. Yeah, um, so which artists should we concentrate on to excite students about graphic protest posters? Um, gosh, I mean, I feel, sort of feel like, um, I think some of the contemporary artists, I think really do speak to our current moment. Um, I know Melanie, Melanie and Jesus have covered a lot of, of different issues that we have here, the Trayvon Martin poster, but they create a lot of work um, sort of honoring and celebrating activists as well. Um, Ernesto, I think is another great example of that and one who's reached a, raw, a, a broad audience. And he's actually someone who does use a lot of different media, including stencils um, in his work. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Um, um, well, and Faviana, who here we show like one of her very early works, but she's another artist who really has spoken um, quite publicly and educating people about um, yeah, about activism and art and how they um, and how they can really and how you know how you two can be can be an activist. So I think that she's somebody who's who's um, worth looking into, you know, up into up into her contemporary work also. And she's based in the Bay Area. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Shepard Ferry is another great stencil user. Thanks for that. And actually, Ernesto um, worked with with Shepard Ferry, so that's actually sort of a, a lineage of of work there. I don't think I mentioned that in the talk. Um, yeah, well, so I see a couple of questions about newspapers here, and I think actually the newspapers are sort of interesting, and I, I think that, you know, anything can be a poster. I think a lot of these artists, you know, recognizing that newspapers have a broad circulation, um, took advantage of that tabloid printing to create a poster, and, you know, posters sort of has you define it, right? Some of these things are printed on computer paper, some of these things are professionally printed, you know, offset lithograph posters or screen printed posters. Um, and, you know, and, you know, when you go to a protest, you see people handwriting posters on, uh, on poster boards. So I think that to some degree, um, a poster is, you know, is in some ways a way that something, it's, it's a, you know, a piece of communication. Um, but um, I think that newspapers are actually something that's been used really effectively. I think Emory Douglas is, you know, really a fantastic example of that. But in a more contemporary way, um, if you look at the Women's March posters, um, there was concern that there were restrictions for the DT, ZT Women's March, um, the, the sorry, the We the People posters that um, from Amplifier, that there was concern that there would be restrictions on how large a posters could be carried. So in order to get the posters out to a broad range of people, um, they actually printed them deliberately in a newspaper so it easily could be folded and, and hidden and then um, taken out. So that was sort of a, a thoughtful use of that medium. And I know um, that the UTLA poster was also printed in, as a full page ad in the LA Times. Um, as a way to get that message and that image out there. But um, a different than a newspaper article, I would say that it's, you know, in, in its graphic form, um, you know, that you're rather than having, you know, to take the time to read, which is also important, posters are really meant to grab your attention immediately um, and often to, um, to force you to start thinking about an issue that maybe wasn't on your mind before. Um, so that's, um, in terms of do people today have protest music, I'd imagine, yes, I'm, I'm not a music expert. Um, 
but I, I know that that uh, music plays a, a role, I think, in activism around the world, for sure. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate all of you guys chiming in, you know, sort of with your tips on, on screen printing. I think um, there's a lot of expertise on this on this webinar and I love learning from everybody here. Any other questions, folks? We still have some time left. We can end early for sure, but I wanna give everybody an opportunity to ask Stacy their questions because she is a fount of knowledge on this topic. Um. So where students create amazing, powerful art or student films, where do you recommend it shared, showcased, or be seen? I mean, I think right now, I feel like so much of the activist art that's happening is happening online. Like when I was you know, doing research, you know, you, one of the best ways to learn about some of this work is through artists, you know, social media feeds and things like that. You know, I would, you know, sort of find out about an artist, start researching them online. And so I think that that's a way, a lot of ways that people build relationships and build followings. I think, you know, some of the artists, I didn't talk too much about street art um, in this presentation, but there are some artists you know, who post their works around um, to different levels of legality. Um, but that certainly is way, ways that um, activist artists have gotten their messages out into the world. Um, but um, in terms of st student films, um, you know, I, I, I'm not familiar with, I, I'm not, I don't really work on films, so I'm not as familiar with like festivals and things like that, but I know, you know, again, like a lot of the stuff, you know, that I, a lot of the research and a lot of these artists, I was introduced through work that they posted and films that they posted online. Um, and I will say that LACMA actually produced films with a few of these artists, um, which will be online. Um, I don't think they're quite up yet. Um, in terms of how do teachers handle presenting activism to young ch children, you know, I think that that's an ongoing um, and evolving conversation. And I feel like probably one that everybody in this room who, who you know, I, I am um, the mother of a young child, but I am, you know, and I'm always trying to teach him, but I think that there's probably other people in on this Zoom who have more expertise on that subject. And I'd love to hear um, from all of you um, on ways that you, you start those conversations. Um, because I think that there's things that I'm still trying to learn on that subject for sure. But yeah, I know that there's been, you know, especially in the last few years, um, great lists of, of books that for all ages that talk about, you know, about how the ways that young people have also been part of movements. And um, I think that sometimes introducing um, children who are themselves voices for change um, is one way to start thinking about it with younger audiences. Um, examples of contemporary posters placed out in the world in quirky or unexpected places. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, one of the works in the show was actually um, in the background of an art exhibition on TV. But um, So it's interesting the way that things get out there. But um, I don't know, I feel like I see the, um, some of these posters I've seen poster, posted on walls everywhere, but I can't think of anything that's particularly quirky. Um, oh, great. Thank you, Laura, for the, that list. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Stacy. That was such an informative presentation. I love the way that you connect these different lineages of, of artists and educators. Um, it just was so helpful for tying everything together and understanding like what, how important community is um, for this movement building and activism. Um, for everybody at home, I'm gonna put our links in the chat one more time, including the survey link. Um, please fill out the survey, let us know what you thought. I know Stacy would love to hear your feedback. Um, so definitely, um, Check out the Padlet we created. That's our, our Valentine to you. Um, check out the programs and resources. And I hope to see you all on Thursday for our first workshop where we'll be working with Yarn to make some activist messages um, using like one or two words only, really simple messages. It's gonna be awesome. So 
Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Stacy, and good night. Thank you, everyone.